30 seconds yeah. to what air. What do you think about flowers? I think we should have these are for the guests. Uh, Pam, I need some more books for these mics. Do you want to have the promo for the show notes? Wait, where's the Fiji water? Is this, this isn't, is this tap water? 15 seconds. Can somebody get the cat? I can't drink tap water. Where's the cat? Can, can, can someone tell Joe's mom to stop vacuuming? It's not hard to find. Has anybody this seen beach. my hair gel? Fijian water, natural. Quiet on the set, live in three, two. Live from Joe's mom's basement. It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you heard the one where the economist walks into a brothel? <laughs> what? 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 It's not a joke. She's upstairs. Oh, oh, wow. Hey, here to talk about the risk and your life decisions, we welcome economist Allison Schrager. Plus, it's National Leave the Office Day, but we're not leaving today because here, with their look at the college savings plan landscape, we welcome from Morningstar, Madeline Hume. We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller, answer a letter from the mailbag, and stick around long enough to deliver today's trivia. And now, two guys who are stuck here for the entire podcast, losers, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. For a moment there, I was confused who was coming down here, the person that owned the brothel or the economist, and maybe know how to prepare. (laughs) Both of them talking risk. That's exactly. Right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Monday's A Good Joke Day podcast. I'm Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across from me, wearing a disgusting t-shirt. What's funny is we are both wearing college t-shirts today. What's that all about? It's, it's, it's like we had a memo. Yours is a faded red, though. Maybe that's just, the, maybe that's just my uh, eyesight this morning. Mine is a faded red shirt. It's, uh, okay. it's, it's well worn. I'm, I'm wearing my uh, Arkansas Razorback shirt. Did you get that free with $40,000 of tuition? It's incredible what happens. You send your daughter there and you get a t-shirt. It's amazing. They should give you a free t-shirt though, shouldn't they? They probably don't, but they should. You know, it's so good that it feels like a huge value is Skillshare because with Skillshare, you'll join millions of students already learning with this special offer. Get this OG, two months unlimited access to over 27,000 classes on Skillshare for free. To sign up, head to Skillshare.com forward slash SB. I love my Skillshare classes. And we're also brought to you now by Simple Contacts, an easy and convenient way to renew your contact lens prescriptions or reorder your contacts from anywhere within minutes. You're going to get $20 off your first Simple Contacts order by heading to SimpleContacts.com forward slash SB and entering promo code SB. Cheryl uses uh, Simple Contacts, and it's super easy. We've got a great show today. Coming out of the weekend, Allison Schrager is here, incredible economist, fantastic book about uh, risk management and brothels. But first, we've got some headlines, so let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline today comes to us from Financial Planning, the website where financial planners Hang out. Uh, this written by Sean Aloka. The $1.26 trillion digital milestone that may spell trouble for Vanguard. W- what do you think dun, about that? Dun, dun. I know, right? That Of course, it was clickbait for me. I'm like, trouble for what are you talking about? Vanguard's robo advisor may soon have competition at the top. The firm's personal advisor services still claims the largest portion of digital client assets, topping. $106 billion in assets under management last year, but competing offerings from discount brokerages like Schwab's intelligent portfolios may soon vie for the crown, according to the latest study of digital platforms by eight group, A I T E. I. <laughs> by I group. Our position is that online brokers will be the dominant factor moving forward, says I group senior analyst Alois Perker citing a portion of the $6 trillion on brokerage platforms expected to transition to fee-based advice. 
In fact, discount brokerages are expected to control the plurality of robo-advisory assets by 2023, cornering almost half of all digital assets, according to the study. On the other hand, product managers like Vanguard are expected to account for roughly a third of all digital assets, setting up a head-to-head matchup between two of the industry's most dominant digital players. Low-cost investing pioneer Schwab now manages more than $3.5 trillion in client assets. The firm began charging clients flat fees for its intelligent portfolio robo-advisor, catering to a younger consumer base that prefers to pay for products on an ongoing basis. Digital clients pay $300 for a financial plan and a $30 a month instead of traditional asset under management fee. So I want to get your take on this, OG. Vanguard, the number one player. You think there's any uh, this, there's any any truth that uh, Vanguard might be shaking in their boots? Well, no, I don't think that they're shaking in their boots, but I did hear that all the low-hanging fruit has been kind of gathered, so to speak, on that platform. And it's interesting when we, you know, when we hear these numbers bandied about like 100 billion and 2 trillion and 3 trillion and just how amazingly gigantic that number really is, you know. And I think what's missing in all of this is that there's there's no ultimate winner here. It doesn't have to be. There's so much that everybody can do it the way that they want to do it. And if you're a consumer of this, you can have a relationship in any way you see fit. And there's a platform for it. If you like the Vanguard uh, PAS model or whatever, the personal advisor service thing that they got going on, or you like the Schwab Intelligent Portfolios, or you like the Fidelity Zero Cost deal, or you like Wealthfront, or you like Betterment, or you like Robin Hood. I mean, there's hundreds of them and people come out with them all the time. There's so much that you can find whatever it is that you like the best. And what's great is that all of these companies can be successful. So it's not so much about one beating the other because they're, they both offer different things, or in this case, Schwab and Vanguard offer different things, but they can both be successful. I don't, I don't know why it has to be one or the other. I think that was my takeaway from this, too, is that there's so many different things that you can do, but but the world, OG, is changing. It's always changing, and you got to reevaluate, I think, from time to time your relationships. And if you're somebody using a, a discount brokerage platform, being stuck on a single name and being myopic that this is the only thing, this is the only place where I can invest, whether it's Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, Vanguard, Schwab, whatever it might be, and saying this is where the answer is going to be for my entire life is absolutely horrible. I mean, my dad was an assistant plant manager at a GM facility. My dad used to be incredibly all GM all the time. That's it's If you did not, if you owned a Ford, it was a problem. And, right. and then in the late 90s, it was if you're not buying an American car, it's a problem. His scope widened because the world changed. And now my dad's like, car's a car, man. You know? Yeah. Everything yeah. Ever, everything changes. And to, and to just focus on, nope, I'm only going to do business this one way. And, and when we hear that all the time on the internet. And I think that, uh, that that's got to widen that lens and see what the competitive landscape always looks like. Because there's always... There's always something better. And and by the way, there's or also different. No, doesn't necessarily mean better. Well, yeah, and right. that's what I was gonna say too, was that there's also a danger in just comparing too often. Like jumping, mm-hmm. oh, maybe this platform's better. Maybe that one's better. So Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting, you know, how many times have we heard somebody say to us offline? I've listened to a lot of the podcasts. It seems like maybe you talk about the same stuff every so often. It comes up again. And we go, yeah, well, the reason is because people need to hear it. I mean, how many people do you think have heard that you should go to Stacking Benjamins slash Magnify Money? And we've said it every other day since aught six, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> but I talk to people every week and, and I'll say, oh, you've got a hundred grand in cash. Where's it at, Chase? You know, I'm getting 0.01. It sucks. Like, you know that there's an alternative for that. I talked to somebody last week that said, well, but our money's at Fidelity. We have Fidelity stuff. I said, that's okay. You can have Fidelity stuff at other places too, but it has to be at Fidelity. Why? Are you part of the Fidelity family somehow? Like his grandpa, the Oaks. I mean, because that happens, right? You know, sure. like we're going to have a GM car. Why? Because grandpa worked at GM, damn it. And yes. that's how it's going to work. You yes. Know? 
okay, fine. But uh, if Fidelity is the it has a tool that we can use, we can they'll sell it to anybody. It doesn't matter where you have it at. They don't care, you know. So yeah, you have to evaluate it from time to time. But when it comes to financial planning, sometimes good enough is good enough. So you know, I like that companies are innovating. I like that companies are coming out with new stuff. But I don't come down on the side of, you know, it's kill or be killed. I think there's plenty enough business for everybody. I think the pie is big enough for everybody to get their share, so to speak. And I think that invest money, that's the number one thing that matters. And in our second headline, Morningstar's out with their 2019 529 college savings plan landscape. And here to walk through it with us on My Dad Shortwave, it's uh, Madeline Hume from Morningstar. How are you, Madeline? I'm good, Joe. Happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy you're here with us. What's changed lately on the 529 plan landscape for people that might not have looked at these uh, college savings vehicles in some time? So, Joe, we grade the 529 industry kind of on a curve. And on average, investor experiences have gotten better. So fees have fallen. um, The underlying investment quality in these plans has improved. And allocation processes have been strengthened recently. Uh, as these industry as the industry has made these improvements, though, the pack is kind of starting to spread out a bit. So some plans are continuing to establish a lead and continuing to innovate in this space, whereas other plans that have stayed stagnant or haven't made these changes are looking increasingly less attractive. By making changes uh, to the plans, do you mean that there's more choice or the choices are better? I know you said fees have kind of come down, performance has gotten better. What are the differences between the good plans and the bad plans? Yeah, um, the things that we like to see in the good plans, and uh, to your point about investor choice, I think they have gotten better, and there continues to be an expansion of kind of uh, high-quality plans and more places for investors to look. So things that we like to see in the 529 industry, uh, we rate them on the five Ps. So people, process, parent, price, and performance are kind of our, our framework for evaluating these plans. So People is looking at the money managers of these plans, basically which asset management firms they partnered with, Fidelity's, Vanguard's, American Funds, um, and we like to see a really strong partnership there. Process is basically evaluating how these plans are constructing options for either financial advisors or for individual investors. And we want to see a really thoughtful process that helps investors prepare for kind of the college savings hurdle. Price is a huge consideration for 529 plans. Typically, they're priced more expensively than uh, kind of a comparable mutual fund. And so we like to see those industry fees kind of come down, and we have seen them compressed in recent years, although plans that are sold directly from a state to an individual are typically cheaper than ones that are sold through a financial intermediary. And then finally, parent, we like to see a strong state oversight, basically making sure that the state is allocating fees properly and making sure that investors have the best chance of saving for college. I was surprised to see that one state has just a ton of assets. Why is Virginia by far number one in the 529 plan space? Yeah, so Virginia, that plan is a partnership with American Funds, and it's the only plan in the 529 space that does partner with American Funds exclusively. And so American Funds distributes that plan nationally. And so people that want to partner with uh, American funds are kind of steered towards that plan. And additionally, Virginia's been a really great steward of 529 plans. And so there's a lot to like about that plan, and they don't overlay too many fees. So we rate it silver, and uh, it's definitely a compelling option. Yeah, and I want to actually step back to some stuff that you put out in October, which are some of the best plans that you guys have seen this year and last year. Which plans did you guys rate as top options? Yeah, so kind of the cream of the crop in the 529 space, they've managed to stay ahead of the pack for a while. And so these plans have been gold, each one of them for at least a year, if not more. So some of the best options include My529, which is a Utah plan, the Vanguard College Savings Plan from Nevada, Bright Start Direct Sold College Savings, and then the last one is Invest529 from Virginia, which is the direct sold plan. Uh, College America is the advisor sold plan. And what we really like about these plans is um, there's a diversity among them. So Invest529 and Bright Start uh, offer investments from multiple firms. Uh, Utah does as well, but they do all of that themselves, whereas Illinois Bright Start and then Invest529 partner with asset management firms to kind of deliver uh. those. And then Nevada's uh, Vanguard plan offers uh, really compelling low-cost Vanguard options. That's cool. So there's diversification of investment managers as well. That, that seems to be fairly new to me too, Madeline. 
Yeah, so it is kind of an industry trend that as these plans are trying to kind of increase the quality of their investment options, they're starting to source them from uh, multiple firms. So Illinois is an example of a plan that used to partner exclusively with one asset manager and then decided to take a different approach. They work with Union Bank and Trust, um, who picks a bunch of different options from different firms to give investors more choice. I was surprised to see that you have two funds on the list that rely on Vanguard, a company that's known for low fees, still get an F from you. That was surprising. Yeah, that's absolutely something that we've been watching really closely, and it's an item that we touch on in the landscape. So 529 plans are more expensive than their mutual fund counterparts because there are several layers of fees on top of just kind of the underlying fund expense ratios. So we try to tease apart kind of what those underlying components are. One of those is the state fee, so essentially what the state takes home for overseeing the plan. And then there's also the program management fee, which is basically covers the operational costs of running a plan. And so for those smaller plans that don't maybe have as much in assets, those program management fees are higher to cover the costs, which operationally are a bit higher. So investors in those states, it's incumbent upon them to kind of weigh any tax benefits they may get by investing against their in-state mm. plan investing in their in-state plan against kind of any sort of fee savings they may realize by getting a better deal elsewhere. And that's the Arkansas plan and the North Dakota plan. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, Another plan that also gets an F on fees for us is the TD Ameritrade plan uh, out of uh, Nebraska. And that's because there's a comparable plan in state, the uh, Nest direct sold plan that offers pretty similar investments, but TD overlays a 25 basis point fee on top of that plan just for marketing. Obviously, you guys have dug into this a ton, Madeline. And if people want to get more and maybe look at their 529 plan or compare and contrast at Morningstar, where exactly on the site do they go? It's currently on the front page of Morningstar.com, leaders and laggards in the 529 marketplace. And we encourage you to check it out. Madeline Hume, thanks for spending a few minutes with us talking 529s. Joe, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks again to Madeline for calling in. You know, Oh, gee, I I really like this idea of 529 plans in states now offering a range of different fun families instead of just, you know, when my kids were going to school, it was all you would go to Alaska because it was one family or you go to Mm -hmm. Utah because it was another or Michigan or whatever it might be. Now I can have multiple fun families in one state. That's that. That's pretty cool. Isn't it interesting that it's taken, what, 20 years for that to come around? People are talking about, well, I use this as a corollary because people talk about like when are HSAs going to be finally easy to deal with because they're a pain in the butt right now, mostly. They cost a lot of money to manage and all that stuff. And the product selection sucks. Well, think of 529s. How much money is in the 529 space right now and how long it took to start paring this down and getting brokerage platforms for 529 plans and that sort of thing? Some of that's legislation reasons, but uh, one our HSA is going to be really easy to deal with, eh, you know, 2040. Well, it's funny you bring up ease to deal with because one platform, OG, before we get to our takeaway that's super easy to deal with is Skillshare. Over 27,000 classes are on Skillshare, and I've used them for digital photography. I've used them for graphics. I'm starting to use them for some business streamlining classes. If you're not familiar with Skillshare, it's an online learning community for creators with more than 27,000 classes in the areas I talked about, but also other areas of business. There's financial planning classes and more. You'll find countless ways to fuel your curiosity, creativity, and career. You can take classes in social media marketing, mobile photography, creative writing, illustration, It's all over the map. So whether you're looking to discover a new passion, start a side hustle, or gain new professional skills, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. To sign up, head to Skillshare.com forward slash SB, and you're going to get two months of Skillshare for free. Our designs have gotten so much better. Our Instagram is actually looking very pretty lately, and it's because both uh, Gertrude and I have uh, taken Skillshare courses. That has been the difference. But not only that, when it comes to Skillshare courses in general, OG, I just like learning. Who was, who was the, who was the poet? Dylan Thomas, who said, you know, you're learning or you're dying. You're growing or you're dying. Is that Dylan Thomas or Bob Dylan? I don't know. <laughs> one, of, one of those Dylan's. Probably Bob Dylan. <laughs> 
Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare. Get two months of Skillshare for free. Skillshare's offering stackers two months of unlimited access to over 27,000 classes for free. Head to Skillshare.com forward slash SB. I think our takeaways here, number one, speaking of reevaluate, it might be time to reevaluate your 529 plans with all the changes Madeline's talked about. Maybe head to a place like Morningstar to see how your 529 plan is performing. And then uh, second, Vanguard back on their heels? I seriously doubt it. Probably not. (laughs) Oh, man, this, this woman is incredible. Allison Schrager is an economist. She's a journalist at Quartz. She's co-founder of Lifecycle Finance Partners, a risk advisory firm. She's divided her career into all different things, finance policy and media. Guess what she did, OG? She led retirement product innovation at Dimensional Fund Advisors. There's a fun family for you. Yeah. Yeah, no thing or two about that. She's also consulted to international organizations like little tiny organizations like OECD and the IMF. Is that the thing that um, is a mission impossible? Yeah, yes. Yes. They're the ones that send out the messages. With Ethan. Uh, that destruct. Ethan, yeah. This is going to self-destruct, Ethan. She's been a regular contributor to The Economist, Reuters, Bloomberg Businessweek. Her writings appeared in Playboy, Wired, National Review, and Foreign Affairs. She's an undergraduate degree from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD in economics from a little university called Columbia uh, she teaches at NYU, lives in New York City. But today, she's in the basement with us. Let's say hi to Allison Traeger. And coming down the stairs to the basement right now, it's our new friend, Allison Schrager. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so happy that you included us in your tour. By the way, whose idea was it to call the book An Economist Walks Into a Brothel? Because as our longtime fans know, Allison, we love bad dad jokes. And that sounds like the horrible start to a bad dad joke. It did. I met one of these comedians from the 60s who did ask me what the punchline is. And I'm like, I never thought of that. And he thought of some not really great ones. But, you know, he's still working on it. Actually, you know, to call the book... it caused works about and so brothel was the publisher's decision, but I'm not very good at titles, but it was the original chapter title, the first chapter. And I did come up with it for that because, you know, the whole point of the book is, you know, I'm a, I'm a retirement economist. I'm not really used to being around people. <laughs> and I kept putting myself in these really bizarre situations where I kept thinking, oh my God, if my advisor could see me now, he's going to be like, you were such a waste of my time. And it's like walking to the brothel was the first time I felt that way. I'm like, goodness, I was supposed to be, you know, at a pension fund calculating liabilities. And here I am. It's, it sounds way, way more fun than that. Except for you, I'm sure for you, calculating pension fund numbers or uh, actuarial tables or something would be way more fun. I don't know. I, they're both fun for me. You know, the, the brothel definitely takes you out of your comfort zone and you learn some new things. Well, talking about being out of your comfort zone, I want to read from the beginning of chapter one. You write, despite the bright Nevada sun, the room was dark and the air stuffy an obscure. I love Lucy rerun playing on mute. A bell rang and a nondescript pudgy man entered. Suddenly about a dozen women came running from a maze of long hallways whoosh past me and lined up in the foyer. Every woman folded her hands behind her back, stepped forward and said her name. The man pointed to the second woman on the left, a Zaftig platinum blonde wearing a red thong and lace bra. She took his hand and led him to her room. What brought you into that scene? I can't imagine you sitting watching the scene unfold in front of you. Yeah. um, Well, I was invited initially to the brothel because I was doing a story on negotiation skills because what that woman did after that, she went, took him to his room and they actually did a negotiation of what services she would provide and what should be paid. So they trained the women in negotiation skills. So I had an experience in the brothel from that. But when I was there the first couple of times, I noticed how much they were paid, like way more than uh, sex workers are paid in their local illegal markets. So that's what kind of got me thinking about, you know, risk decisions and sex work and different ways, you know, people are compensated for risk or pay to reduce risk. 
Well, let's talk about risk in, in this context, because a lot of people, I think at a gut level, we understand risk, but I don't think we understand all the different facets of risk and all the different types of risk people can take. People get paid a ton more, but you write the sex worker doesn't actually keep all that much of that money. Exactly. So what's interesting about it is customers pay way more, like three times the amount. But the sex workers don't really make that much more, at least on an hourly basis in the brothel, because they have to give 50 percent of their earnings to the house. And not only that, because they're legal sex workers, they have, they're 1099 employees. They have to then pay a significant amount in taxes. So the end is not clear. And plus, like they have to deal with being in a brothel, which is like any job. It's what's strange about the brothel is it's so much like any other normal workplace. Like there's (laughs) staff meetings. There was um, financial literacy training. There was even like a brothel cafeteria where I'd sit and sometimes do some of my interviews. And like there's even this weird politics that you get everywhere. Like one woman, every time I went to the brothel, would like pull me aside and be like, you know, it's not right that Alice makes so much more than me. You know, they don't know how skilled I am. And she would like, give me her sex resume. It's like someone who pulls you aside a job. Like, don't they know I have an MBA from Harvard? It's like, it really is all this crap they have to put up with. They, and, they Not to cut you off, but they told me and mentor of mine told me early in my career to stay away from clusters of misery. And there's these <laughs> groups of people else in their clusters of misery. It sounds like even at a brothel, there's clusters of misery. There are. I mean, as I said, like the whole dynamic, who succeeds, who doesn't, the politics of getting Dennis's favor was really just like any other workplace. And, you know, like most people, most people don't want to deal with that. So especially when you can work independently so easily. Yeah. Let's talk about Dennis for a second, because, you know, you go through those numbers, uh, they take half, then they have all their expenses that they have to pay for. On top of that, they have to pay, you know, 100 percent of their tax versus somebody who works for somebody else. A lot of your your FICA tax, uh, the employer portion is taken care of for you. So they're paying a higher tax, all of their work stuff. They're independent contractors. They take half. I think Dennis, when you refer to Dennis, he's the owner. It feels to me like Dennis is ripping them off. Well, what I found interesting about Dennis is when I think of pimp, I think of someone who pushes sex workers into these very dangerous situations and takes all the proceeds. In financial markets or in any market, you kind of know if the market's functioning well, if the people who take the biggest risk get the biggest reward. And traditionally in sex work, that's not really how it it works, partially because it's an illegal industry, so you don't have this sort of functioning market. But what's interesting about Dennis is he made more money than anyone else, but by being this sort of almost like market maker for risk-free assets – And so he took the spread by providing a risk-free encounter for both buyers and sellers of sex. How did, how did he come up with that number? Do you think though, where he knew people would go for it? These sex workers would go for it. I mean, do you think over his career that he kind of found out where the market was? I think that's pretty standard. I mean, there's other brothels in Nevada and they've been around forever. So I think that was just always the standard thing. The other thing that's strange is, well, I found shocking. I was like, all right, 50% is that they get tips But they also have to hand over 50% of their tips. And he sends in testers. He like says, okay, you can have a free sex worker encounter if you report back if she reported all the tips you gave her. Wow. So it's almost like he's got secret shoppers. Yeah, he has them a lot. They, I mean, they're, it's not only to make sure they give all the chip money, but to make sure that they use a condom and all these other things. Yeah. So – I get his point of view. I kind of feel like if we're making a financial analogy, like he's somebody offering an annuity, right? There's, yeah. there's I'm offering you this guaranteed place where things are going to be very safe and I'm keeping a bunch of money for me in exchange for that. For the, for the sex worker though, what's in it for them? Why would they give Dennis half of their income and go through all this? Well, being a sex worker is super risky. I mean, think about it. Most sex workers work illegally, which means they advertise online and then they meet strange men online and then they go to a hotel room or an apartment or whatever with them. And I mean, you, you're like, it is very dangerous. They could be the police. They could be a deranged lunatic who will beat them up or maybe even kill them. So they have to go undergo like careful sex workers in the illegal market, go over, undergo these really extensive screening process, which takes forever and is really time consuming and is still not even a guarantee. But they don't have to worry at all in the brothel. It's totally legal. There are panic buttons in every room. There's brothel security. They also don't have to worry about getting arrested. They also have a lot of assurances. They've got access to a lot of disease screening. So it's also low risk for them. But I'm sure these sex workers, though, have thought about 
hey, what if I didn't do this? I mean, how many of them that you talked to said, maybe I should just go back to the street so I can keep all my money? I mean, I spoke to a bunch and some said they thought of it, but, you know, they all were like, in the end, it's like, I don't want to break the law. Or a lot of them are just like, I should be able to do my job. You know, a lot of them are sort of advocates and like, I should be able to do my job and have it not be illegal. That's so interesting to me. So they're also paying uh, then, I mean, to put it into risk terms, they're paying for security as well. Totally, is it? And that's where Dennis takes his spread on the buyer and the seller, both yeah. sides. Well, let's talk about the buyer. If a uh, if somebody walks into one of these places could pay maybe two thirds less or half the price on the street, why do they come here instead? Well, you pretty much are guaranteed there'll be no Robert Kraft situation. You know, you're not going to get arrested. You're not going to get blackmailed. You know, even if you can charge it on your credit card and it's some harmless sounding charge. So it's completely risk free for them. It's funny. So everybody here is paying more for security. You know, I'm surprised talking to all the women and to the, uh, the men were less excited to speak to me. But the ones I did talk to, a lot of people just hate to break the law. Yeah. Like a lot of us yeah. just are not people who want to do something illegal. And the option to do something legally means a lot to people, especially people who want to work and just aren't natural lawbreakers. Something that was interesting to me was because of that, there's a different clientele here. And people might be uh, women might be younger on the street, but older women tend to do pretty well at the brothel. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I had this amazing data. This economist scraped all the data from the and managed to get from the websites. And I got amazing data on illegal transactions. And yeah, younger women on the street get paid more. But in the brothel, the older women got paid more, largely because the most popular service is something called the girlfriend experience, where you actually provide like emotional comfort and intimacy that gets the biggest premium. That's why older women tend to do better because older women tend to be more attuned to other people's emotions, more sensitive or better at cultivating a regular clientele. When we talk about risk there, it's funny from the person paying that there's no risk of rejection from the woman. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no, I mean, the social risk and the risk to your ego even, uh, I guess, enters into the computation. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people when they haven't seen sex work up close have a lot of images of what the customers are going to be like. They always picture these horrible men in Scandinavia and they're talking about in the UK making sex work criminalized that you're just going to go after the men. But I think that's also inhumane because a lot of the people you meet there are just really lonely. And I think really afraid of intimacy for a variety of reasons. You know, the sex workers there make them feel safe, that they don't have to risk rejection, that they don't have to risk being known for whatever reason. And they'd probably just be really lonely without this option. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you go through all kinds of stories in the book. You talk about professional poker of, of Phil Helmuth. You also talk about uh, breeders when you talk about diversification. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second with all the stuff that just happened a couple of weeks ago at the Kentucky Derby. I think breeding horses is a good topic. <laughs> you talk about diversification there. Bridge horse breeding with diversification for me, if you don't mind. In finance, you diversify, and it does this ma magical thing. Generally, in risk, in finance, there's this reward. You get more, you take more risk, you get more reward. But it's possible you can just take unnecessary risk. You can have two portfolios at the same expected reward, but one's riskier than the other, and that's called inefficient. You should always take find this magical portfolio that's this magical combination of stocks that gives you the highest reward for a given amount of risk. And like through, you know, years of financial research, people have come up with this. I pretty much figured out that that's just an index fund, because if you diversify a lot, if you hold a lot of everything, you'll get the most reward for the least amount of risk. Now, it turns out horse breeding under diversifies because what they do is uh, starting in the 1980s, the tax reform essentially nixed this tax shelter or well, horses as a tax shelter. So before you had a lot of people investing in horses and people would breed a horse and race it maybe two, three, four years later. But then after tax reform, it became just too expensive and too risky and all the investors left. So the breeders were left holding all of this risk. So what they started doing uh, they started doing it before, but it became much more popular after 1986 to sell a horse after one year. But the problem is, is that one year you have no idea how good a racer or a horse is going to be. So the only thing, the data point people really go off of is who are its parents? And, you know, a mare can only, you know, bear so many horses in a year, but a sire can, there's no limit really to how many horses they can impregnate. 
So what's happened is because there's such a big premium on parentage, the number of desirable sires has shrunk considerably. And now a sire, before a sire, like I think some of those popular sires in the 70s and 80s might breed, I don't know, 30 times a year. Now they're breeding like well over 200. Talk about <laughs> sex worker right there. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the, I think the most graphic sex scene in the book was between two horses. I saw a breeding up close. It was intense. Um, but you can imagine what this means is now since the 80s, horses become like crazy inbred. So it's a real under diversification because genetic diversification is a lot like financial diversification is you just get more predictability. If you inbreed a lot, you get what looks like a portfolio if you invest in only two stocks. You get this incredibly wide distribution where odds are you're going to underperform, but there's a chance you'll get that genetic freak with all these you know, characteristics that will be the next secretary. The odds are really slim. On average, you'll do a lot better and have much more predictable outcomes if you crossbred more. But they go against that specifically. It- they do, well, the incentives are too, because sure. if you're going to s- sell after one year, you know, yeah. you do increase your sale price, but the racetrack performance is not going to be as good. It's interesting how that analogy really holds. I mean, if you want to really make a ton of money in stocks, don't diversify. If you want to be okay, then diversify. Yeah. Although odds are you're not going to make a ton of money. Sure, it's like right, if, you, if you're willing exactly. to go for that long shot, <laughs> right. you know, and you're, you're willing to odds are doing well, but the odd time you're going to pick Amazon, you know, you're going to be crazy rich. I want to ask you about that. I mean, that's kind of like playing the IPO game, which we won't get into, but it seems like we are really bad at, as people, when you talk about risk of identifying, maybe not identifying, but measuring risk. Mm -hmm. Do you have any easy ways for us to kind of look at risk and go, I mean, do we need to compare one risk against another to kind of get a feel for which risks are worth taking and which risks we should maybe ensure? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's different ways to think about it. I mean, you could think about, you know, the traditional ways to look at a a distribution, like a probability distribution is the way it's measured and priced and moved around in finance. And, you know, certain risks have a wider distribution than others. So volatility has more meaning. If so, if that distribution is wider, if there's a bigger range of things that can happen and it's more unpredictable, then that's riskier than the other. But the problem is, is we really have it struggle to internalize probabilities. I think they don't often have a lot of meaning to people. And the research shows, and some people think that's some sort of behavioral defect, although I think it's just, you know, probabilities are fairly modern invention and doesn't, it's not surprising our brains don't conform to these sort of mathematical concepts that people came up with in the Renaissance. But there's research that if you think in terms of natural frequencies, like instead of 1%, you do one in 100, that when people are presented probabilities in that way, they actually make really sensible risk decisions. Is that why Monte Carlo simulations seem to work so well when financial planners use them with clients? Do they work well when they use them with financial? Do you think? I, fe- I don't know. I feel like it because I feel like if I tell somebody that they have a 40% chance of making it and then I show them if they do this other thing, they that increases to a 78% chance of making it. People kind of get that. They're like, oh, OK, well, increase my odds to 78%. I'm good. Or is there a flaw in the Monte Carlo simulation world? No, I, I'm a big fan of Monte Carlo simulations. The problem is, as I said, is I think sometimes people hear one thing and then something happens and they're, you know, as I said, it might be helpful to say, well, 78 out of 100 times might have even more meaning than 78. Or the great thing about Monte Carlo financial planners is you have that picture. I think that picture starts to resonate because you can see that distribution and we see where it's shaded in. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny how visual we are as people, too, to your point. I also think I read something about um, in hospitals, doctors who presented to the patient that they had a 20 percent chance of living. Their patients did much better than doctors that presented it as you had an 80 percent chance of dying. Interesting. So there was this, there's this just difference in how optimistic the doctor presented the stuff. But did you find some quirky stuff like that in your research where, where just how the data was presented or, or something that went against the grain about how you think about risk? Yeah, totally. I mean, and as I said, like, I, I think I used the example, I think it's from Gerd Gergerenzer, who's this uh, German psychiatrist who studies all these ways you can show, he's sort of the anti kahneman and that he, he he's, believes people can really grasp risk and really can make sense of probabilities. It's just all in how you present it. And he had this example of there was a new birth control pill in the UK, and this report came out saying, if you take this pill, you've doubled your odds of a blood clot. But really, all it meant is one in 7,000 people before got a blood clot versus two in 7,000. 
And like he said, he, according to his estimates, all these people went off the pill. And then he, he was able to uh, get this exact number of like increased abortions as a result of this. But really, if they just said one in 7,000 instead of two in 7,000, probably everyone, no one would have gone off the pill. It's so sad. And maybe for people listening to this, maybe why when somebody presents data to you, you should ask a second question. Yeah. And I think it's becoming a bigger risk or issue in that, you know, in the age of big data, we can get this information presented to us like on our phones instantaneously. Like there's that access to sort of, you know, big data means you can calculate risk probability so easily now. But how it's presented to you really can have a huge influence on your decision making. Yeah, absolutely. The book is called An Economist Walks Into a Brothel and Other Unexpected Places to Understand Risk. Allison, the book's available everywhere, I assume. Yep. It's so fun talking to you. Congratulations on making it through your brothel experience. (laughs) Uh, How wild was it when you asked them, just I guess one last question to end this. When you asked them, you said, hey, I'm an economist. I want to come visit the brothel. What did they say? Well, they invited me the first time. And when I came back, they were sort of like, oh, OK. I mean, what was what was hard is, you know, they, I had this survey because I needed to collect price data. And that all these women presented with this survey, like this economist wants this, this information. And some of them were like, I don't know. But then when I showed up, you know, one way I kind of got them to come around is, uh, you know, I had my laptop with me with all my data on the illegal market. And I actually sat in the brothel parlor with a bunch of them and started running numbers so they could see how much people earned in the illegal market. And you could break it down by characteristics. So they were quite interested in knowing how much more they people make if they have breast implants. <laughs> so it's like I'm sitting in the brothel parlor like running Stata. And I, you know, I, I'm such like a mom to all them. I'm like, you know, you don't know that it was the breast implants. Maybe it was more confidence or maybe more of an incentive to charge more to pay off their investment. I don't feel like you should feel pressured to do this. And they're like, shut up, no. <laughs> Hey there, procrastinators. Do I have some news for you? If you've already forgotten, today is Leave the Office Early Day. An exciting idea for men and women, but a horrible day for children everywhere who will finally have parents find out what they're doing while they're away. Because, uh, you know, I'm great at this job. I've been researching on the Googler machine, and it turns out that today is actually about being productive. Right. Apparently, we're supposed to work more efficiently today, which in turn lets us get done with the day more quickly. That's disappointing. I'm telling you, the man finds a way to get his pound of flesh either way. So how about some work-related trivia today, huh? Here's your the man ain't telling me what to do question. According to a Harris poll and career builder survey, what is the number one reported time waster in the office? I'll have your answer right after I pretend I'm deep thinking for the next few minutes while I'm napping here at the desk. This episode of Stacky Benjamin is brought to you by Simple Contacts. You know, Cheryl, my spouse, wears contact lenses and she always finds that she, oh gee, she just dreads that annual appointment to get the prescription renewed. That's why when we started talking to simple contact. She was super excited. It's a great new app that makes the time consuming process of renewal. Well, super duper simple. Cheryl and I walked through it together. This was amazing. It lets you renew your prescription and reorder your brand of lenses from anywhere in minutes. It brings the doctor's office right to your house. The vision test is designed by doctors and every test carefully reviewed by a doctor. Simple contacts has an amazing selection with every brand of lenses and their prices hard to beat. The eye exams is 20 bucks and they offer free shipping. I do have to say though, the simple context vision test, that's not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. I don't wear contacts. I wear glasses though. And this is not the same thing. All the simple context does is test your current prescription which helps you see 2020 and renew that prescription. They don't write completely new prescriptions or examine the health of your eyes, which is an important thing. So when I told Cheryl we were taking it online, she's like, okay, really? I mean, she detests everything to do with the exam, but I think she thought it was going to actually be harder. So we sat down, we started going through the process. And what's funny is 
I kind of tuned out about halfway through because it was it was unbelievably easy and uh, different than me. He works online all the time. Cheryl never works online and often gets frustrated. And this was just boom, 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 boom on her phone using just her thumbs. It was amazing. So to save 20 bucks on your first Simple Contacts order, head to simplecontacts.com forward slash SB and you'll enter promo code SB at checkout. That's 20 bucks off your first Simple Contacts order when you go to simplecontacts.com forward slash SB and then enter promo code SB at checkout. How about that? Welcome back, you good-looking trivia gurus, you. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the thought leader here at Trivia Central. And uh, the guy today helping you stick it to the man on National Leave the Office early day. So let's get on to the trivia segment, shall we? I'm trying to leave the basement a little bit early today, after all. Here's your question. What was the number one reported time waster in the office? Your answer? If you said cell phones or texting, you'd be right. But... Uh, what's that? Oh, looks like someone's calling me out on Twitter. Oh, oh, hell to the no. Oh, I'll be right back. There is no way I'm taking this crap from Golden State and Thor's 52. That dude's got another thing coming. What do you mean, basically, you're right? Well, all the things that I gave you an example of. None of those were messing around your cell phone. No. Oh. But you were close, I- but smoke breaks. I was going to say, that's not as cool as it once was, I suppose. I no, don't know. No. You guys are missing out. You get like five minutes off every 50 minutes. I remember once I had... I assi- don't smoke, by the way. So I had an assistant that smoked when I was a financial planner, and we'd be in the middle of some discussion, and she'd go, hey, do you mind walking outside with me while I smoke? I'm like, sure. And I would go out there with the smokers, and I got to tell you, back on the loading dock, the people looking just miserable with their cigarettes, I'm like... I just don't want to stand out here. Like this would be the reason for me to quit right here. Cause I do not I, want to stand. I have out a here. really funny story about this. We should talk about it later. Maybe R- remind me. We might, but now we got to throw out the Haven lifeline. OG. Okay. Cause we're going to tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven life insurance agency, they put what you value first. It's summertime. So sweet tea and sweet corn. Mm, I'll take the sweet corn. You can have the sweet tea. You don't like uh, sweet tea? It's your loved ones and your time, and that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. Their application's simple, it's online. I say this every time. It's simple, it's online. And then I always am amazed when people go, Ah, it was really simple. It, and it was online. That's that's why we say it was simple. Yeah. Uh today we're gonna throw out the Haven Lifeline to Jason. Say hi, Jason. Hey guys, appreciate the show. Haven't learned a thing. Um, wondering what the OG thoughts are on risk parity investing, uh, specifically having maybe a 50 50 mix of stocks and long term treasuries in hopes of getting the highest return for each unit of volatility. Does he think this is a viable strategy going forward, considering the rates have been going down for, you know, 35 years? Um, yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Probably won't uh, learn anything, but you know, whatever. Thanks. Bye. I think somebody, and by the way, what's the howling in the background, Jason? Hear the howling in the background? It's him telling his buddies, like, I'm going to ask this question. And he hit record before they, before they stopped laughing. Before they stopped. Yeah. Somebody has the stick out and they're trying to rattle your cage. It's okay. See, so very calm and collected. You can tell that I am. Yes. What up, J-Dog? So... I like the marketing spin that companies use on this stuff. I especially like the risk parity fund that uh, Wealthfront came out with, stuffed 20% of everybody's portfolio and doubled the fee, didn't tell anybody, and it was uh, non-opt out. And also, it's sucked since they launched it. So that um, that's also really fun. But how do I think about them in general? This became really popular from uh, this whole Ray Dalio thing in the Tony Robbins book. Now, Ray Dalio... Pretty good investment guy. Tony Robbins, not an investment guy, but he wrote a book about investment guys. So that makes him a de facto investment professional. I don't Expert. know if you knew that. Expert. Yeah, if you. All capitals. In yes. quotes. Well, it's more underlined. Oh, underlined. It's like parenthetical. Tony Robbins, expert, financial <laughs> wizardry. But Ray Dalio became very wealthy and his clients have become very wealthy with something along this strategy. The problem is, is that it's very hard to recreate 
when you don't have a hundred billion dollars to deploy and when most people can't short the market because you don't know how or if you're going to try, you're going to do it wrong and lose a ton of money. Um, the opportunity to have, you know, both sides of that trade at the same time, you kind of default to like what you said there, Jason, you default to I'm going to buy treasuries and stocks, which isn't a risk parity fund. That's just being 50 50. That's that's having half my money not growing and half my money growing and going, hey, what do you think? Am I pretty balanced? Well, you're balanced in that you only have half your money growing. The other side of that that you pointed out is as it relates to interest rates, which is if you're going to buy a uh, fixed income, you try to make money on that with, with interest rates declining. We're all surprised when they continue to go down from time to time. But if you look at the yield curve, you'd see that there is no added benefit. There's no bang for your buck once you get past five or seven years on the yield curve. So you're going to have a 10 year bond, a 20 year bond, a 30 year bond, whatever you get the same yield. So you're going to expose yourself to bigger price swings, and potentially bigger losses on the, on, on interest rates going up if you try to do this with longer term bonds, hoping that you do it the other way. So how do I sum up? Oh, let me sum this up. N no, <laughs> N no, is that yeah, that's about as succinct as I can make it. Because I mean, just think of it this way. What are you trying to do with the concept of it? What are you saying? You're saying that somehow you, Jason, J dog, J dollar bill, can figure out how to get a better return with lower risk than anyone else or than the vast majority of everyone else. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Like, there is the efficient frontier. That's what I was going to ask. Recently. Why wouldn't we, if we're going to do this convoluted strategy, this risk parity strategy, why wouldn't I just go find the efficient frontier? Like, seriously, why wouldn't I do that? Well, the thing is, is that it sounds really super sexy. It just does. I mean, I can somewhat get behind if somebody said, hey, I, I do have this really asymmetric investment profile because I have so much money in company stock and then I have to offset that with so much money in fixed income. I can't, I can't do all this other stuff. I can kind of sort of get to that. Although I would just tell you, sell all your company stock as soon as you can, because you know, that's silly to be diverse, you know, under diversified like that. But, um, uh, especially once you've made all the money you need to make, but effectively with what you're trying to say with a risk parity fund is I can figure it out. And you're going to the market with, ETFs and individual stocks, and you're competing against a Ray Dalio that can go to Goldman Sachs and go, yeah, I want to create a new product just for me. What do you think? I'm going to give you $10 billion to make it happen. And Goldman Sachs goes, yeah, sure. No problem. That's who you're competing against. When somebody thinks up some of this stuff, they can create the thing that they want to do with massive scale immediately. And, and you're going, yeah, I'm going to try to do this with the IVV and AGG. What do you think? You know? All you're doing is reducing the overall return potential on your portfolio. And yeah, you're less risky. Absolutely, you are. Less volatile, not risky. You're less volatile because you have now a 50-50 portfolio. And that is less volatile than a 100% zero portfolio. But it also generates less return. So, no. I'll go back to that. It's, it's, it's almost like Allison was talking about earlier about understanding, you know, the measures of risk. Really really kind of diving into the different types of risk that are out there. Because I feel like whenever you try to control one type of risk, you bring in, inadvertently sometimes, you bring in a different type of risk. You know, like as an example, people worried about the stock market will put their money in a savings account. Well, you just went from market risk to interest rate risk because you're not going to earn any money. Yeah, an inflation risk. Absolutely. Yeah, an inflation That's risk. It. Yeah, sure. Good stuff there. Thanks for the question, Jason. J J Dog. J Dog. I'm sorry. J Thanks for the question, J Dog. If you got a question for us, uh, it's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And the 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 J Dog is taking home a Haven Life Stacking Benjamins t shirt. Gertrude's gonna send him a code for the greatest uh Money show on Earth, fun circus T-shirt. Uh, we also have some letters that we're cleaning up here. We no longer take letters, but we have a few here still to answer. The reason why we stopped taking letters is because of the fact that 
we got so far behind and uh, there was no way we'd ever catch up again. And case in point, I think we told people about three months ago that we were stopping taking letters and we're still answering letters. Chris says, Hey guys, I promise on the slim chance I learn anything. I'll keep it to myself. I'm 58 with about one and a half million in investments. Unfortunately, almost a hundred percent tax deferred and want to retire by 60 with a plan to start off spending around $90,000 a year with a slow reduction to 65,000 about what we spend now. By the time we're around 75, since I know you'll complain, that's not enough information. (laughs) He says that one and a half million includes the $300,000 cash value of a pension that the numbers seem to indicate I should take as a lump sum withdrawal rate uh, below 6%. My employer provides retiree health care insurance to bridge us to Medicare. We have enough term life insurance to replace the lesser of our two social security incomes through 80. My question is, Should I factor in any sort of opportunity loss when doing my break-even analysis on claiming Social Security? Assuming the same spending with or without starting it earlier would keep more nest egg funds invested in those early years of retirement rather than being liquidated for expenses. When I do the math, it moves the sweet spot four years with a 3% opportunity loss and eight years at 5%! Exclamation point. Since I think we've saved enough to bridge the gap, and by waiting until 70, Social Security should pretty much cover our requirements. I'll get 41, and my spouse will get 30. I'm likely going to wait, regardless of your answer, but for some, I'm more concerned with preserving their capital to support a higher spending, but shorter planning horizon, less concerned with longevity risk, it should change an important decision. Am I missing something? What's the right way? Chris. I think that this is one of the interesting discussions that happen in financial planning because we all use a time horizon that is much, much, much too short. When we're thinking about our goals, we think about things like, I want to retire in five years or I want to retire in 15 years. And then when I'm retired, I will live for 30 years. So that's how long my, you know, my retirement is based on. We also use assumptions that I think are really funny that uh, just kind of, you lose like the telephone game, you lose like the reason for how you came up with it, like the 4% number, like, oh, well, I can take 4% out of my portfolio forever. (laughs) The study said that it's 4% has a high degree of certainty for 30 years. And if you retire at 60, you might live 40 years. So just saying, you know, maybe you want to do less than four, but um, this is one of those things. Social security. So a couple of thoughts on it, generically speaking. Number one, we have no idea our own life expectancy. We can't use the context of other people in our family because healthcare and the rate of change in that industry is so profound, we can't even comprehend it. The human mind cannot do exponentials. It just, it, it just, it just doesn't work for us. So, so it's hard for us to look at somebody who lived to be, you know, grandma and grandpa lived to be 90, and we go, well, okay, yeah, I should plan for 90 or 92. No, you should plan for 120. Right. I mean, it's just, it's, it, there are machines that are really close, if not there, being able to take cells out of your body and recreate new organs when they go bad. So you're like, oh, yeah, my kidney's bad. I'm going to go get a new one real quick. And oh, I don't have to wait for a donor. It's a perfect fit and a perfect match because it's made of my own stuff. And it took a week for them to make it. And then they put it in me. And now it's good for another 50 years. You know, like that stuff is on the horizon. And we just can't fathom yet how that's going to work. So when you look at, the time horizon, you have to assume that that number is a bigger number than you think. If you think 90, you have to say 100. If you think 80, you know, you have to say, you know, 95 or something like that. So in that case, it almost always makes sense to look at the longer time frame on the age 70 versus 66 or 67, depending on full retirement age. But conceptually, this is how I think about it. You have two buckets of money. One, you have invested how you have invested in your you know, investment portfolio based on your specific, you know, how you've picked it out, right? The other one is guaranteed to grow at 8% a year, but may grow as high as 10 or 11% a year. Guaranteed for the next four years, two buckets of money. Which bucket do you leave alone? You're going to leave alone the bucket that's guaranteed to return at 8% a year, or maybe nine, or maybe 10, or maybe 11, or maybe 12, depending on what inflation is. And that's what Social Security offers, those delayed retirement credits are at least 8% a year for every year that you wait, plus whatever that inflation rider is or the inflation adjustment is for that year also gets added on top of it. Whereas you have another bucket of money, your investment portfolio, that's growing, and it may also grow at 8 or 9 or 10%, but it's not guaranteed. So 
I would trade away the guarantee versus the non-guaranteed. But then the other side of you will say, yeah, but what happens if I get by a bus when I'm 74? Yeah, that's a sucky deal, except for that your spouse will get the greater of those benefits. So when you, when you extrapolate that and you say, hey, I'm a healthy 60-year-old, my spouse is a healthy 60-year-old, what's our joint life expectancy? There's a really good chance one of you is going to at least see 95, statistically. So when you take that two-person retirement and you eliminate the, well, but one of us might get hit by a bus, the answer almost always comes down on the waiting side of things, even though you're going to spend some of your portfolio. The only other thing that I'll add to Chris's description of his plan is his assumption of reducing his lifestyle at 70. I want to retire at 60. I'm going to spend this. And then at 70, I'm going to reduce my lifestyle. Go talk to a whole bunch of 70-year-olds before you think about this. 70 is like the new 50, right? 60 is the new 40. All these, everybody says that stuff. There's not something magical that happens at 70 that be, you know turns you into you know a decrepit old person. That's unable to do anything, you know, you will probably. Yeah, but he said willing. that's he said it's about what he spends now. So they're going to go over and above what they spend now down to what they spend. Uh-huh. now. Have you ever known anyone in your entire life, Joe, back when you were a financial planner to go, hey, I got a 50 percent pay raise. And then they and then about three years later, you're like, hey, so about that 50 percent pay raise, I think you should start saving it all now. And they go, well, yeah, but it's way cooler to live on that now. No, but you, way more fun. No, but you do see naturally over time that uh, people can't spend as much. Of course, that's when the healthcare expenses seem to start kicking in too, though. Sure, I just don't think it happens at seventy. No, it, agreed. It happens Maybe later. Put and later that at later. eighty-five. Yeah. Say at eighty-five, we're going to dial back. Yeah, our spending. I've got a couple of resources people might want, even though OG oh, incredibly thorough answer there. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, you're welcome. We had a discussion with uh, Lawrence Kutlikoff about this very topic and with uh, Philip Moeller and Paul Salman a couple of years ago. We'll link to that on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Also, another resource, my buddy in Texarkana, Devin Carroll, is one of the top experts in the country here. His uh, big picture retirement podcast often focuses a lot there, and he also has um, an email list that dives into Social Security and a YouTube channel that you might want to check out. So those are some people on the forefront. I don't think, in my mind, you can learn more about Social Security. If you really, really want to dig into all the nooks and crannies, you know, OG, those little tiny areas, like let's say that I'm on my, uh, I have... Uh, th- seventh marriage. and <laughs> That's exactly where I was going, right. On my seventh marriage, and I have all these... Uh, these social security things going on in my life. And the the frustrating thing talking to Devin is that often the people at the social security office have given him the wrong answer. So that's discouraging. So we'll also have those resources for somebody that wants to dig more into social security on our show notes page. All right. That's going to do it for today. Big thanks. People have left a review of this podcast. It's always helpful to new people to know what they're getting into when they listen to Stacking Benjamins. This comes from Sports Rants. Mom's got this one on the refrigerator. Five stars outstanding. Top-notch diversity in topics. Great wisdom and personal financial plannings. Thanks to Sports Rants for that review and uh, for noticing that we try hard to have a lot of diversity on our show, not just in topics, but of different uh, points of view. People in all different uh, places, different stages of life, different backgrounds, We try to make sure we have a pretty diverse show. That's going to do it. Thanks for hanging out with us again today, everybody. Thank you, OG, for hanging out. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? Take some advice from Allison Schrager and look at all of the risks involved in a situation. Hoarding money in cash to avoid the market? You've just opened yourself up to interest rate risk. And you won't reach your goal because your money isn't growing. Thinking about working the local street corner? Well, you heard Allison talk about that already. Second, it's National Leave the Office Early Day. Find a way to get out and enjoy life. I'd like a... What? It's... Breaking... Up! Doug, man. No, no, I'm not. I'm not here. The signal is... I can still see you sitting right here. Fading! No... Seriously, stop making that. 
No, seriously. <laughs> you. I can see you're making that thing with your mouth. Stop doing it. Special thanks to Allison Schrager for joining us. You'll find her book, An Economist Walks Into a Brothel, wherever books are sold. Thanks to Madeline Hume from Morningstar for calling into Joe's Dad Shortwave. You'll find more on Morningstar's 529 plan landscape and 529 comparison tools at Morningstar.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Sorry, folks, gotta go. You are going to tell us a story. Welcome to OG Storytime. My name is Joe. Once upon a time, back when I was a financial planner. Back in the no, day. Back, back a long time ago, many moons ago, during the training program when I was at uh, American Express, probably still, Ameriprise, whatever it was at the time. The setup of this was very much on the job training. You'd, you'd hire somebody, they'd go through the classes, the licensing requirements, and for about 12 weeks, they would have kind of a, a training schedule for, you know, where they would go somewhere and during half the day, they would learn a specific thing. They might learn, you know, how to talk about disability coverage or the ins and outs of, you know, what an IRA is or whatever, you know, just kind of like learning financial planning. And then the, the majority of the day was spent in the office shadowing other advisors. And then after a period of time, then they got the opportunity to start calling on people for themselves. But during that time, usually probably about another year, I think, if I remember right, you would always have another more senior advisor in your meeting, right? So for a while, you'd kind of hang out with in my meetings and I would say, hey, this is Joe. He's a new advisor and he's just going to sit in the corner and be quiet. And then after a while, you'd have your own meetings and I would say, I'm just here to help Joe because he's relatively new, you know, or whatever. So we hired this person who, uh, who liked to smoke. Oh, no. Love to smoke. More than anything else in the world, I believe. That was the thing she liked to do most. <laughs> We're in a meeting. It's an evening, right? I mean, because early in your career, you take meetings at 8 o'clock at night or whatever. And it's, I remember and, those days. That was so horrible. Uh, so tough. So when people ask, you know, like, how do I become a financial planner? Well, first, work 13 hours a day for six days for the next five years. Anyways, so um, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even say it with a straight face. It's so mind bending. So we're in this meeting for this advisor's client and uh, we're talking about God knows what. And literally she gets up and walks out of the meeting. Like it's, you know, we're halfway through it, right? It's just going on and without like, hey, excuse me guys for a second. I'll be back. Not any, just up and out. Just stands up. Stands up and and like I mean it isn't by the doors. So it's not like like I'm just gonna sneak out. It's more like I'm in this corner and I have to walk across the entire room, you know, kind of excuse me, you know, and out right. And so I'm doing this meeting, and I might have been two other people. There might have been two of us in there. I can't remember. But anyway, so we're doing this meeting, and I'm standing up at the. I'm kind of illustrating something on the whiteboard, and I look out the window. And here this person is, like, with her face pressed against the window, smoking. <sighs> like, like, it's in the dark, and all you see is the cigarette. And she's looking at her the... face against the window. Does your, and, cl and like, your client see in this person? 
no, she the, the client did. It was her client, right? Yes. So, yes. so this is the stage where no, I'm but helping I'm, her. No, but I'm saying, did the client see? Because if I yeah. saw my advisor just leave the room no. and has has their face pressed, I'm no. like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. And I look and I just kind of just like, oh, oh, my goodness. You know, and I'm trying not to draw attention to it. But you know how there's different types of smokers, right? There's the person who just sits out there and has a cigarette and you know, talk on the phone pretty leisurely. And then there's the person that's like, I have six minutes. I think I can get through 11 cigarettes in that time. Right. <laughs> so that was this person. And so not only do you see like this occasional glow, you know, with her face, like it's dark out. Sure. Her face is like literally pressed against the window, but then it's like repeated. <sighs> and then like, here's a lighter of another one. <sighs> and then finally she walked back in. <sighs> it sits back down like nothing <laughs> happened. And I just kind of turned. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You see everything. We had a so funny. We had a young gentleman who didn't last very long. And, you know, uh, when I started, I, I had to buy very, very, very cheap clothing. And a lot of people do. And no judgment on the clothing, even though to attract clients that had some wealth, you had to, to some degree, look the part, right? You had to, you had to dress, dress well without spending a lot of money. But initially, a lot of people don't know how to do that. Well, this one particular gentleman wore very thin shirts, incredibly thin shirts. And he would take his jacket off during the meeting. And he had, he had copious, copious amounts of hair. He was a fairly, he was a very hairy dude. It's like a bear. And so even though his shirt was white, everything under his shirt, you could see right through his shirt, including all the hair and his nipples and, and, <laughs> And everything. And if, I, I just, I can't describe how bad this guy's shirts were. And people would tell him just, I mean, far, I would never have wanted to be in the position of having to tell somebody about how to dress. And the guy who was running our training program, very good at it. And he told him like three times and the guy's like, no, I don't want to wear, I, I, I don't want to wear a t-shirt. I don't want to wear an undershirt. I, I like the way I dress. That's, that's the, that's mm. it. You, you, you go, you go into a meeting. I mean, if it was you, me, whoever, and you just have this shirt that is see-through it, you can't focus on financial planning. You're too busy going. That is one. Hairy. I hired a bear. <laughs> You're like, can you do me a favor before we talk about my Roth conversion? Could you just say "rar" really loud? <laughs>